Good morning, greetings friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I use nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and sometimes deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your vitality and health and well-being, and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health challenge. That is why we are here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 31 years of practicing pharmacy, I have seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes, hypertension, obesity, skin diseases like psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, acne, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds, recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle. But what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure. Because the human biological system is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And while some folks may call that healing, renewing, regenerating system a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health or nutrition or prescription drugs, we are here for you. We welcome your phone calls on the bright side, 844-236-6010 is our number, 844-236-6010. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we can help you do that. If you have questions about the longevity products or the longevity business or a success story you'd like to share, or if you just want to contribute to the conversation, 844-236-6010 is our number today and every day on the bright side, 844-236-6010. Try to call in early so we can get to as many calls as possible at 844-236-6010. If you want to purchase any of our Longevity products, Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, Nightly Essence, Fucoid Z, they're all up at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com. You can also sign up to join the Brightside Ben team right off the website for a one-time $25 fee. You could start yourself a longevity business if you're an entrepreneur or if you like the entrepreneur lifestyle. You're going to enjoy the longevity business because you can make money, make your own hours, and help change the world with nutritional supplementation as well, especially if you're health-minded or you like the world of nutrition or you like helping people out in terms of their health and physical well-being. Longevity might be the business for you. Call 866-735-2470. That's 866-735-2470 for more information. Or you can sign up right off our websites, brightsideben.com pharmacistben.com and criticalhealthnews.com. Also want to remind you to check out our Truth Skin Health products, truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. If you're dealing with blemish skin or aging skin or you want to prevent blemishes or aging or hyperpigmentation, if you want to thicken up your skin, get some more collagen going, have a more youthful and a smooth and soft looking appearance. You want to know about our Truth Retinol 5% Gel, also our Truth Serum, Truth Balm, and Truth Omega 6 Healing Cream. They're all up at truthtreatments.com. We have a skin health blog at truthtreatments.com as well. Never any preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, water emulsifiers, surfactants, nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want in any of our Truth Skin Health products. Check them out at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Okay, so we've been talking about green tea for a couple of weeks now and it's interesting activities and health benefits. We said yesterday a lot of green tea's benefits come from its anti-diabetic properties. If you're a diabetic and you're drinking coffee, you might want to consider switching over to tea, to green tea. It supports your insulin. It's an ideal uh, beverage for diabetics who are dealing with blood sugar problems and who have weight issues too. One of the most tr uh, troubling signs of diabetes or pre-diabetes, so-called dysglycemia. I much prefer that term, dysglycemia, messed up blood sugar. I much prefer that term to diabetes. Dysglycemia implies that 
the changes in blood sugar are a process and they're a verb. Dysglycemia just means you got messed up blood sugar. It's not like it's a disease. It's just like your biochemistry is off. Diabetes is an official diagnosis, official disease. Once you get diagnosed as a diabetic, you go into the computer as a diabetic, you get coded as a diabetic, you get insurance rates as if you're a diabetic, you get protocols for a diabetic. But if you're just suffering from messed up blood sugar, well, just stop eating or eat differently or stop stressing. The only two reasons why blood sugar goes up, folks, is because of insulin and cortisol. That's it. Insulin and cortisol. Insulin, of course, is a food hormone. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And if you're dealing with elevated blood sugar, it's a food issue and it is a stress issue, period. It's not a drug issue. It's not a medical issue. It's not a doctor issue. It has nothing to do with your doctor. Zippo. That's why doctors tell you, oh, we can't cure diabetes. There's no cure for diabetes. Of course there's not because it's not a disease. It's not a sickness. It's just messed up blood sugar. Green tea, as it turns out, has been associated with helping stabilize your blood sugar and also now with fat burning, according to a study from the University of South Wales published in the July 2015 edition of the journal Nutrients. Women who drank green tea while exercising burnt, quote, significantly more fat, unquote, than those who didn't. Researchers concluded that green tea ingestion increased fat burning under resting and post-exercise condi conditions when compared to placebo. And as we said yesterday, green tea just doesn't have fat burning effects. And it isn't just a caffeine drink that gives you energy, although it will do that. It also has some pretty substantial relaxation properties, which are a function of its theanine content, T-H-E-N-I-N-E. -E. Theanine may just be the most important nutrient you haven't heard of. Most people haven't heard of theanine, although some folks are aware of the stuff. Theanine is the secret to the relaxing effects of green tea. Theanine is very similar to a brain chemical called glutamate, your yippee chemical. I call it your yippee chemical, your energizing chemical, as opposed to GABA which is a relaxing chemical. The brain, uh, brain energy functions in a balance between excita excitation and inhibition. Excitation is regulated by glutamine. Inhibition is regulated by GABA. As we said yesterday, GABA is a form of butyric acid, which is a wonderful short chain fatty acid that is made in the digestive system from fiber and probiotics. Just another reason why gut health is important for brain health. Just another reason why probiotics and for that matter, fiber can have a very important effect on mental health, brain health issues, anxiety issues, jitteriness issues, even depression. We talk about this all the time. Do not underestimate the power of the gut. Do not underestimate the relationship between the gut and the brain, the so-called gut-brain axis, which is exemplified by the production of GABA and the relationship of GABA to brain health and the relationship of GABA to digestive health, GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, which, of course, you can buy in pretty much any health food store. It's a great way to, a great um, uh, supplement to take before you go to bed if you're dealing with anxiety issues. GABA has been used to treat seizure disorders. GABA probably has something to do with the success of the ketogenic diet when it comes to treating seizure disorders. So glutamate is by far the most abundant neurotransmitter in the brain. It's mega important. There are folks who believe that it may have a relationship to uh, autism disorders, schizophrenia disorders. Uh, there are physicians who call it an excitotoxin. That is too much glutamate can create toxicity. It's related, uh, uh, it has a role in uh, memory creation, thinking, cognitive issues. Excessive amounts of glutamate can cause some toxicity. And uh, it's called excitotoxicity. This is associated with changes in brain chemistry that have been associated with a whole slew of health issues, including ALS and dementia, seizure disorders. Glutamate is found in foods. It is an amino acid that's in your brain, and it's an amino acid that's in foods. And it has a lot to do with a very interesting taste called umami. U-M-A-M-I, umami. For centuries, chefs and food connoisseurs knew about four basic tastes. Their uh, taste, uh, sweet taste, sour taste, sweet, uh, bitter taste, and salty taste. Sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. Those were considered to be, for thousands of years, for at least hundreds of years, the four basic tastes. Then, at the beginning of the 20th century, Japanese scientists discovered that there were some really interesting compounds in seaweed. The Japanese were very fascinated with seaweed. They used it as a major source of nutrition. And I've talked about seaweed a lot on this program. In the future, you'll be hearing a lot about seaweed as a source of protein and a source of vitamins, a source of minerals. Like everything in the ocean, it's abundant. Seaweed is abundant in terms of its quantity, and seaweed is abundant in terms of its nutritional value. 
value in Japan and in Asia. They were very focused on seaweed as, in terms of uh, how they, uh, in terms of foods, but also in terms of research. And at uh, the beginning of the 20th century, Japanese scientists dived into seaweed, so to speak, and found some really interesting things. We'll talk about that when we come back from our break. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. We'll be back right after this. Okay, we are back on the bright side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll get your calls in our next segment. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, the longevity products, or our Truth Skin Health products, or if you just have a comment or a success story you'd like to share, 844-236-6010 is our number. We have lines open for you. And we will get to your calls in our next segment. If you want to purchase any of the longevity products, your advertiser recommended on our program. Or if you want to join the Brightside Ben team, call 866-735-2470 or check out our blog. And uh, news stories and posts at brightsideben.com, criticalhealthnews.com, and pharmacistben.com. You can also head over to benfuchsarchives.com, which is a compilation website with all my other websites. Thank you to Peter in the UK for setting that up. There's also a search engine at benfuchsarchives.com. And if you want to check out our Truth Skin Health products, they're all at truthtreatments.com, including our blemish repair complex for folks dealing with acne blemishes or Truth Serum, Truth Balm, Truth Omega-6 Healing Cream, and our Truth Retinol 5% Gel. You're not going to find 5% retinol anywhere, folks. And what's more, our 5% retinol gel is pretty mild compared to most retinol products. If you try to use retinol or retinoic acid in the past, if you've heard about the benefits of retinoic acid, and they are legion, it is, along with vitamin C, the most powerful and important topical skincare ingredient you will ever use, period, end of story. The only problem with retinol is it is a little aggressive, it is a little bit stimulating, and that's why I created my Truth Retinol 5% Gel, with a lot of, uh, which a lot of folks are using two or three times a week. Now, it's not for everybody. Uh, you can't, everybody can't use it two or three times a week, but some folks are using it two or three times a week, which is unheard of in the world of retinol and retinoic acid for a 5% retinol product, never any preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, emulsifier, water, silicon, nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want in our Truth Retinol 5% gel or any of our Truth Treatment products, and they're all up at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Okay, so glutamate is a really, really fascinating amino acid. It gets a lot of bad press, unfortunately so, and undeservedly so. Glutamate is extremely important. It's the most important brain, brain neurotransmitter. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. It is found in foods. The Japanese first discovered this. They were researching seaweed back at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, they've discovered that glutamates had an interesting taste. They realized that there was a taste that wasn't being accounted for that was a fundamental taste that belonged with the four other fundamental tastes, sweet, sour, bitty, bitter, and salty. And they uh, called it umami, which basically means delicious taste. And it is a delicious taste. Umami can be thought of, and that's U-M-A-M-I, by the way, umami can be thought of as the savory taste. And as it turns out, according to Japanese researchers at the turn of the 20th century, when uh, uh, glutamates were produced in, a, in abundance when high-protein foods like seaweed, which is a high-protein food, were broken down or fermented. This umami flavor, this savory flavor, is what gave soups and broths and seaweeds and cooked meats and stews their characteristic savory, delicious taste. They named it umami, which means do delicious taste, and they recognized it. They recognize it, and soon pretty much everybody recognizes it as the fifth taste, along with sweet and sour and bitter and salty. Human beings have always loved this savory flavor. Back in the days of ancient Rome, they used to ferment fish. They made this, this fermented fish product made with old fish and salt. And, and uh, today, in Australia, they eat something called Vegemite. If there's any Australians listening to this program, you know what I'm talking about. We do have Australian listeners. Vegemite takes advantage of that umami flavor. In, in England, they eat something called Marmite. These are fermented yeast products made with vegetables and spices that some folks find pretty disgusting, but a lot of folks find very delicious. What is it that accounts for the deliciousness? What is it accounts for the deliciousness of fermented rotting fish and fermented yeasts? It's the glutamates. And the glutamates are why we like broths and why we like chicken soup and why we like uh, fermented foods. Umami foods, umami flavors 
have an appeal that transcends cultures, transcends time, transcends nationalities and borders. Every culture pretty much has a fermented type of umami product that they, that they like. According to food and taste scientists, this umami pleasure sensation, the reason we like umamis, umami flavors, which are found in slow-cooked foods and fermented foods, is, is because we evolved to love umami because it was a way that we knew back in the days when we were first started cooking a million years ago or two million years ago, it was a way that we knew that foods had a high protein value. Protein was very, very important as our bodies were growing up and developing. It's still important, of course, but especially important as our brains were developing and our bodies were developing in the African savanna millions of years ago. And we evolved to love this savory flavor, which told us that there was a lot of protein value to the food. And not just protein value, not just protein, but actually bioavailable protein, digestible protein. Umami signals to the brain, the smell of umami and the taste of umami, signals to the brain that there are bioavailable proteins, that there's digestible proteins in that food. We evolved to love umami. We evolved to like uh, to find umami delicious because it signaled a high protein and amino acid content and a high protein and amino acid bioavailability, especially of the brain amino acid glutamate. The umami flavor tells the brain that there's glutamate to be had. Not just that there's protein to be had, not just that there's amino acids to be had, but that there's glutamate to be had. As scientists became more knowledgeable about glutamate and knowledgeable about umami and its relationship to, uh, or knowledgeable about glutamate and its relationship to taste, they start to experiment. And eventually, they came up with an artificial patented version of glutamate, an artificial patented version of umami inducing glutamate. So they could fake out the brain. So they didn't have to have real fermented foods. They didn't have to have real protein in order to fake the brain out into finding a food delicious. So they, they just researched glutamate and they tweaked the molecule. Eventually they came up with a glutamate molecule with a little piece of sodium on it. They took the glutamate molecule, stuck a little piece of sodium on it, and they started selling it as a flavor enhancer. And it worked really, really well. Of course, it was called monosodium glutamate, which is glutamate with a little piece of sodium. Monosodium means one sodium. Monosodium glutamate, or MSG, became this big-time flavor enhancer that, that was, in many ways, was responsible for the popularity, and still is responsible for the popularity, of a lot of processed foods. By the middle of the 20th century, food processors figured out they could add glutamate to anything, and it would enhance the flavor dramatically, and they could sell a lot more product. These days, glutamate is used to enhance the flavors of meats and poultry and seafood and snacks and soups and stews. And pretty much most packaged foods are going to have some kind of MSG or MSG derivative in it. Even ordinarily non-tasty foods like old canned meats, for example, could be made really delicious simply by adding some of this glutamate. Remember, glutamate is a yippee chemical. It makes your brain happy. It makes your brain think it's, thinks it's, uh, it's its birthday. That's what MSG does to the brain. It tells the brain, hey, this stuff is awesome, even if it's just old canned meat, i.e. spam. These days, MSG is manufactured in super large scale. It's used as a flavor enhancer for all kinds of foods, particularly meats, and especially in Asian foods. Asian foods are especially uh, are tip, are, are, uh, particularly uh, benefit from glutamine's umami taste and flavor enhancing properties. In fact, Asian foods have been associated with something called Chinese restaurant syndrome, CRS, Chinese restaurant syndrome. You don't hear too much about Chinese restaurant syndrome, but when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, we used to talk about it all the time. We used to joke about it all the time. We'll talk, we'll talk about that when we come back from our break. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You are listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. We will be back right after this. Right side, Pharmacist Ben here, 844-236-6010 is our number, and we do have lines open for you. We're talking to Wesley in Idaho about cataracts, which are basically a clouding of the eye's lens, leading to a decrease in vision and ultimately blindness. Half of blindness around the world is caused by cataracts. It's associated with diabetes, aging, poor living, smoking, exposure to the sun, alcohol, Pretty much it's just a sign of the body breaking down. It's cataracts or arthritis of the eye. And this is a major theme of the bright side. 
is that the body breaks down generically and it doesn't matter as far as reversing or as far as healing, it doesn't matter where it's breaking down. Cataracts is associated with diabetes because it's a, a, a sugaring of the eyes. It's a glycation of the eyes. It's associated with oxidation and aging and, and toxicity. And if you, need a catara if you need cataract surgery, you need cataract surgery. It isn't going to heal itself. Once the eye is broken down, once the lens of the eye is broken down, and you can't see, you got blurry vision, you got halos around, uh, around light, or you got problems seeing at night or problems with bright light, you need to have surgery. And that's just how it goes. Wes, is that, what were you going to ask me, my friend? Well, I know there are eye drops out there. Is, are they they don't heal. They don't heal the cataracts. They're, they're anti-inflammatory anti eye drops, but they don't heal cataracts. Cataracts are damage to the lens of the eye. Just think of a window. You're looking through a window. If you, your, your car window is filled with cracks, and your car window windshield, I should say, gets damaged, you got to put a new windshield in. Your lens is like your windshield. You're looking through the windshield. And when the lens gets damaged from sugar, you need to have surgery, and that's just how it goes. And, and by the way, it's not, it, it's, it, they do it a lot, and they do it pretty routinely, but it's still surgery. And surgery sometimes can cause problems too. So, and there's some countries where they don't even do sur cataract surgery. So it's a necessary evil is what I'm saying. If you do have surgical procedures done on your eyes, okay, it's extra, extra important that you get on a nutritional supplement program pre-treatment and post-treatment or pre-surgery and post-surgery. And that is true about all surgical procedures. If you want to avoid cataracts, now that's a different story. And it's probably smart that if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s, I know when you're in your 30s and 40s, you don't really think of the body breaking down. But that's really when it's important to prevent these things from occurring. That's really when it's important to pay attention to your sugar intake and make sure you're on a supplement program using vitamin C. For the, uh, these are some nutrients for cataracts, by the way, or to prevent cataracts, I should say. Vitamin C, incredibly important for eye health. This is, all, eye, all eye health issues benefit from these nutrients. Vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, pigments from vegetables, the blues and the oranges and the greens, astaxanthin and lutein and zeaxanthin and the carotenes. All the pigments are important for eye health. Selenium is important for eye health. Zinc is important for eye health. So what you want to do is you want to prevent the cataracts from forming. Once they form, you're not going to have, you got to do what you got to do. But the trick is to prevent the formation of, uh, of a cataract and you can do that very effectively uh, with uh, with nutritional supplementation by paying attention to your diet, especially paying attention to diabetes or, or dysglycemia or messed up blood sugar, Reduce, reducing your intake of fast burning carbs and using nutrients that help your body, uh, help your body uh, process carbs. And you'll get benefits for other parts of your body too. Remember, cat if cataracts is arthritis of the eye or cataracts is eczema of the eye or cataracts is, uh, is uh, Alzheimer's disease of the eye, when you use these nutrients to protect your eye, you're also going to protect yourself from eczema. You're also going to protect yourself from arthritis and Alzheimer's disease and all the other unpleasant ways the body breaks down as we get older. Go ahead, Wes. I'm sorry. What were you uh, going to say? Uh, I never wore sunglasses. I thought uh, sunlight was good for the pineal gland. Yes, it is. Well, I don't wear sun. I've never worn sunglasses either in my entire life. I, actually, I hurt my eyes like 25 years ago. I burnt my eye accidentally in the lab, and I had to wear sunglasses for a couple of weeks. Never worn them before. I haven't worn them since. But I realize why people wear sunglasses, because for two weeks, I had to wear sunglasses. You know what, Wes? You should try this if you've never worn sunglasses. When you wear sunglasses, nobody can see where you're looking. That was what I noticed. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah, I, real, yeah. I realized why people wear sunglasses, because you can be really sneaky. You can, like, you can look straight at people, and they don't know you're staring at them. Yeah. But, I, but, of course, the, the cost of it is you don't get the sunshine, and so the yeah. world looks dark when you wear sunglasses. Go ahead, Wes. I'm sorry. That and uh, uh, colored windshields, I do not like them either. I don't like to be around people with sunglasses. Also, lipospheric vitamin C. Is Liposomal that, vitamin C, is that what you're talking about? Lipospheric. That's uh, just a, that's a fancy way of saying liposomal, I, I believe. Vitamin C, remember, is water-soluble, right? And so when something is water-soluble and they surround it with a liposome, it becomes fat-soluble. A liposome, and I, I haven't heard of the term lipospheric, but I assume it's the same as a liposome. A liposome surrounds a material that's water-soluble with a fatty bubble. 
And so a water-soluble vitamin C can then become fat-soluble, and it can enter, in theory anyway, it can uh, enter, in, enter into cells more effectively. Uh, I wouldn't waste my money on it personally. The body's very well equipped to handle vitamin C. Now, topically, fat-soluble vitamin C is extremely important and extremely valuable, and you never want to waste your money on water-soluble vitamin C in a topical product. And any company that's trying to sell you a topical vitamin C or a vitamin C product with, uh, with uh, water-soluble vitamin C in it, for your skin either doesn't know what they're doing or they're taking advantage because uh, ascorbic acid and other water-soluble forms of vitamin C are very cheap, but they break down readily and they don't penetrate into the skin very effectively. So you might want to use a liposomal vitamin C topically, although I much prefer the fat-soluble form and that's the kind that I use in my truth treatment products. Does that answer your question? Yes, go ahead, Wes. S-P-H- E-R-I-C, spherical. I think that might be a brand name. I think that's a brand name for a liposome. Uh, well, I have to look into that. I, I haven't heard that term. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a brand term. It's not a generic term, liposphere. Companies will call things, you know, make up names to, to create a sense of, uh, uh, like, like it's a unique product, like, like they invented it somehow. So I'd have to look into that, but it sounds like a liposome to me. It, it sounds like, as you described, it's supposed to get into the body better by being protected uh, yeah. to get it into the bloodstream better and not be um, what eliminated from stomach acids or whatever. I'm not sh- I, I would have to look into that you know there's a lot of those kinds of things mostly they're just ways to to extract your money from you ascorbic acid is is handled very well by the body here's the thing about ascorbic acid every once in a while you hear people talking about how ascorbic acid is is either toxic or ascorbic acid is used useless as a form of vitamin C, or it's not really a vitamin. Nonsense. Horse hockey, baloney. Vitamin C or ascorbic acid is handled by the cell very, very effectively. In fact, there are receptors for not exactly ascorbic acid, but something called ascorbate, which is uh, derived from ascorbic acid or a form of ascorbic acid. Once it gets in, uh, once it comes close to a cell, the cell is going to take that vitamin C in as ascorbate or ascorbic acid. And and I do hear chiropractors and other alternative health practitioners talking about how vitamin C is not really a vitamin, and you got to have it with. food-based vitamin C. And that is true, that food-based vitamin C will have cofactors with the vitamin C that help the vitamin C work. But at the level of the cell, it is ascorbate, i.e. ascorbic acid, that is doing the heavy lifting. And that's it. There's no fancy cofactors attached to it when it comes into the cell. And that's what, uh, and that stuff, ascorbic acid, is pretty inexpensive and pretty readily available. All right, Wes, I want to get a couple more calls in real quick, if I can. So uh, thank you so much for your call. Appreciate it. Truth Raider, what's going on, my man? What's happening, money? How you I doing? I got the 12 bottles of the Swear Old V Cleanse. Am I supposed to drink 12 How bottles f- in three days or what? How are you feeling? I'm feeling I'm feeling kind of funny, but I, I'm still feeling kind of fat, still feeling kind of pregnant, but I'm having diarrhea all over the place. <laughs> what are you talking about, Carl? Be serious, man. Or I'm going to let you go. What's, what are you talking about? I you drink that stuff, man. It reminds me of stomach acid. It's a little acidic. Acid. Yeah, it's a little acidic. That's the acid bacteria in there. It's tangy. Uh, is, it, is it hard to drink? Sour. Yeah, sour. it's sour. Orange Which one did you get? Cinnamon. Oh, you yeah, the orange and cinnamon, cinnamon one. Sour. Yeah. Do you notice the energy? A little bit. Not yeah. a big deal. In the middle of the day, when you're ordinarily when you would snack, when you want a little bit of energy, do some Swero V instead of a snack, and you'll notice that you get energy from it. You also notice after you've been doing it for a week or two, and you got to do it for a week or two before you notice this, your digestive system is working a little bit better. Your bowel movements are working a little bit better. You know, when you have a bowel movement, a lot of the a lot of your stool, if you will, is made up of bacteria. So deficiencies in gut bacteria are one of the reasons why people don't have regular or good bowel movements. So keep drinking that Swero V and throw in some nightly essence. Too while you're at it. Thanks for your call, Carl. Appreciate it. And that is all the time we have for today. On the Bright Side, I'm Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for listening. Please check out my websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com for all the longevity products and to sign up and join the Bright Side Ben team and also our Truth Skin Health products, Truth Retinol 5% Gel, Truth Serum, Truth Omega 6 Healing Cream, and our Truth Blemish Repair Complex are all up at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Have yourselves a wonderful, beautiful, awesome, spectacular day. We'll talk to you all later, folks. Bye for now. Okay, we 
are back on the bright side. I'm Pharmacist Ben, 844-236-6010 is our number. We do have lines open for you. Try to call in early so we can get to as many calls as possible. We're talking about umami and glutamate, and we will get to the theanine. There's a very interesting relationship between theanine, the relaxing chemical that's found in, uh, in green tea, and glutamine, or glutamate, as it turns out. Glutamine is not glutamate. Glutamate is a brain chemical that's very, very important, an ex excitatory brain chemical. Glutamine is an amino acid that's involved in detoxification and muscle building, also in brain health. Glutamate's got a lot of important roles to play in the body. It's important for the brain. It's important for the gut. It's important for the immune system. It's related to bone health and muscle function as well as longevity. It does get a bad rap, unfortunately, because of its relationship to MSG, which is a form of glutamate, a synthetic form of glutamate, by putting a little sodium on top of, uh, onto the glutamate molecule, you create MSG, and MSG is a very important brain, brain happiness molecule. It doesn't really make your brain happy, but it makes your brain think that whatever it just, whatever it just got was really good for it. I never, I wonder if MSG. I, I haven't seen any literature on MSG just as a, just as a, uh, a, uh, a happiness molecule. But certainly, when they put it in food, it makes you think the food is good for you. It makes the food taste good. Uh, MSG. MSG is used in a lot of Asian foods, thus the relevance of something called Chinese restaurant syndrome. You don't hear too much about Chinese restaurant syndrome these days, but we used to laugh about it all the time when I was a kid. Oh, you must have gone to a Chinese restaurant. Feeling funny? Feeling, have a little anxiety? Having breathing problems? Oh, did you eat that Chinese food? Chinese restaurant syndrome has an interesting story behind it. We'll talk about that tomorrow as we continue talking about glutamine and theanine and green tea and polyphenols. We'll also, uh, I think we'll finish up talking about green tea tomorrow, and then we'll move on to some other uh, polyphenols, particularly the flavonoids, which are really super mega important, and we're discovering more and more how important they are for overall health function. The flavonoids, also known as vitamin P, they're not really vitamins, but I've always thought that if we, uh, if we had the detection, the detection tools that we have today, back when vitamins were being discovered, we would think that there were a lot more than eight vitamins. Vitamins being essential nutrients that your body has to have, that your uh, body has to have, uh, has to have but cannot make. That's the, really the definition of an essential nutrient. Your body has to have it but can't make it. Vitamins are the quintessential essential nutrients. There are only eight vitamins, but it may very well be that flavonoids and other phytonutrients and polyphenols may be just as essential as vitamins, but we just don't consider them as such because, first of all, we didn't have the tools to really recognize what these things were back in the 1920s and 1930s. And secondly, you only need really, really, really tiny amounts of these phytonutrients for their health benefits, even smaller amounts than you do with the vitamins, micrograms or even, even nanograms of phytonutrients have, uh, can be effective and have a role to play in the body. And it may be that they, they are just as important as the vitamins and other essential nutrients, even though we only need tiny little bits of, those, uh, of these phytonutrients. We'll talk about that tomorrow as we continue talking theanine, green tea, and phytonutrients on the bright side. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. A couple of interesting stories from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Put the brakes on mindless eating. We've all come up with excuses for eating when we're really not hungry, like dealing with a difficult loss or, or a bad breakup or you're depressed. But the problem is we pay a price. Food is medicine. Hippocrates said many years ago, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And when we think of that saying, we always think of the good stuff associated with the medicinal properties of food. Oh, you can use food to treat diseases. You can use food to prevent diseases. You can use food for energy. You can use food if you're feeling sick. But what we don't recognize is that food has a, a medicinal value in a negative sense as well. Food creates biochemical changes in the body. In fact, nothing creates more regular biochemical changes in the body than food. Every time we eat something, the biochemistry of the body changes for better or for worse. This is why calorie restriction is always going to be shown as a tool for longevity. The less you eat, the longer you live. The less you disturb the delicate biochemistry, the, the, uh, the, the fragile biochemistry of the body, 
the longer you live. Now, yeah, I don't want to say the biochemistry is all that fragile because it can adjust, but it takes work to adjust. Yes, the body is, a, is, is the ideal biochemical adjusting system. It pulls the ups, uh, pulls the ups downs, and the, and the downs up. That's called homeostasis. The body adjusts. But the less work it has to do to adjust, the better off it's going to be. Mindless eating is when we eat not because we're hungry, but we eat because of a mental reason. We're not paying attention to what we're eating. So how do you get around it? Well, listen for the real signs of hunger, a growling stomach, feeling tired, a headache. These are true signs of hunger. How often do we eat when we're not hungry? We pay the price. And I'm not beating anybody up for this. I do it all the time myself. Just notice the next time you uh, feel like eating, just notice if you're hungry from your belly or you're hungry from your mind. I lost 50 pounds a couple of years ago. I started to get a little overweight when I reached my 40s, and uh, pretty soon I was a lot overweight. I was 50 pounds overweight, and all in five years I gained 50 pounds. And finally one day I just decided I got to take control of this thing. And what I did was I just started paying attention to when I was hungry and when I wasn't hungry. And what I noticed is there's two kinds of eating. There's the kind of eating you have to do, and there's the kind of eating you want to do. And what I noticed was most of the time I was eating because I wanted to eat, not because I had to eat. So if you just restrict your eating to eating when you absolutely have to eat, you will automatically lose weight. And if you're trying to lose weight by exercise, that's not really going to work. Weight gain is a, uh, mostly a function of food, although stress hormones play a role as well. And I've always said if you're trying to lose weight but absolutely can't, even though you're controlling what you eat, you want to put the blame on cortisol on stress hormone. All right, this is another insidious article here from the public, uh, journal Public Health Nutrition. Majority of TV foods are unhealthy and target children. How nasty is that? Food uh, uh, commercials that target children are especially sneaky. And by the way, when, f when commercials target children, they're not just targeting children for the moment. They're targeting children to cr create brand relationships for that child for the rest of that child's life. So that child will always think that eating at McDonald's is a good thing. So that child will always think that Snickers bars are good things. Or that a child will always think that poor eating behaviors are always in that child and that adult's interest. And this is what branding is all about. Branding creates relationships between products and people. It's one thing to have a, a branding relationship created with your computer or a car or a mechanical piece of hardware, but it's a whole sneaky, nasty, insidious thing to do it with crappy poison food, i.e. McDonald's and Snickers bars. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. Let's welcome Wesley from Idaho to The Bright Side. What's going on, buddy? Hello, Ben. <clears throat> I wanted to get you to comment on cataract surgery, good or bad, as good as... It's better than being blind, Wesley. Yeah, yeah as <laughs> successful as they say it is, it's, they, they say it's very effective. Well, look, if you got a cataract, you're, we'll talk about cataracts when we come back, but listen, there are times when you need surgery. There's no doubt about it. If your body's breaking down, it's falling apart, you break a bone or, or you have cataracts, there's times when you need surgery. It's not a good thing, obviously, but there's times when you need it. we got to take a break, Wesley. We'll finish up when we come back. Okay, don't go away. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Got lines open. 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll return right after this. Don't go away. 